to talk today about the techniques of visual persuasion. And, and the reason I've been thinking about this for the last two or three years is I've come to realize that most of us need to convince someone else to do something. And in today's world, the best way to convince someone to do anything, especially to attract attention, is to use a visual. Yet when it comes to creating visuals, whether it's PowerPoints or photographs or videos, most of us have no clue what we're doing. It isn't a question of art. It's a question of communication. So what I want to do today is to discuss the techniques of visual persuasion. And to do that, I have the infamous PowerPoint slides. Techniques of visual persuasion. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why did you see the picture first? And what part of the picture did you see first? And where did your eye go after you saw the picture? And how long did it take you to find the word emergency? Even though the word itself is big, it's bold, it's bright yellow, why would you not look at the picture? Why did you look at the picture first? And the answer is I knew you would. Hang on, I've lost control of my mouse. I knew you would, but why did I know you would? What was the psychological thinking that went into having you see that part of the picture first? Now, wait a second here. I want to try to get this to move. No, can't do it. So we'll move on. might be having problems, Larry. Don't worry about that. I'm going to reshare your screen, and then um, you'll have to use your keyboard rather than your mouse to do that. Okay. So am I good to go? Just reshare your screen again. I've lost control of Zoom. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Do to do, do to do. There we go. Share screen. And I want to be in. Okay. Hang on. Do to do. There we go. Okay. You got it now? Yep. Okay. Try this. We've seen that. We've seen that. So, my goal is to illustrate the fact that when you need to attract an audience and you need to convince them to do something, what you show is more important than what you say. And when we're trying to motivate an audience, we first need to get their attention. Then we need to hold it long enough to deliver our message. Think about yourself. Think of all the emails you get a day, all the social postings that you get in a day, all the distractions you get in a day. The very easiest thing for you to say is, no, I'm not paying attention. And yet, if our job is to convince somebody else to do something, before we can even do that, we got to get their attention. And all of us are too distracted and, and too not interested in anything new because we're barely able to keep up with what it is that we know to begin with. So how do we get somebody's attention? And once we get their attention, how do we hold it long enough to deliver our message? So I'm going to take this in two parts. I want to take a look at first at analyzing images, and then I want to look at analyzing persuasion. I've spent a lot of time the last couple of years thinking and writing a book called The Techniques of Visual Persuasion, which was the source material for the presentation today. And one of the concepts I came up with are the six priorities on what catches the eye. This is based on some original research that Norman Holland, who taught at the USC Film School, came up with, and I took his work and tweaked it a bit. Because our eye doesn't look at an entire image all at once. It looks at parts of an image, and where it looks first depends upon six criteria. The first criteria is movement. After it checks out movement, it looks for that which is in focus. After it looks for that which is in focus, it looks for that which is different, and then brighter, and then bigger, and then in front. Well, let's take a look at this first. What does it mean by movement? Where did your eye go first in this image? Your eye probably didn't go to the trees or the dust or the horse in the background. You went to the horse in the foreground. Now, there's a couple of things that are playing here, but the horse in the foreground is moving. Even though it's a still, there's clear movement involved. If you think about it, for the last 100,000 years, as humans have existed on this planet, we have either been prey or we've eaten something. When we see movement, the first thing we do is we look around. We say, am I going to eat it or is it going to eat me? There's a self-defense mechanism that's built into our psyche that says movement trumps everything. That which is moving gets my attention. 
Is it safe or am I in danger? Now, even in stills, we like action shots. We like the sense of being inside the movement, just as we are here watching these horses. Why did your eye see the woman in the middle first? She's not closest to the camera. She's not in the distance. She's neither the brightest, could be argued she's the darkest, but we see her because she's in focus. All the rest of these people are there, but if, if there's no movement, our eye goes to that which is in focus first. Why did you see the rectangle? Every shape here is a curve, except the color palette. Every shape here, every, every shape is colored with pastel colors, except the color palette. Our eye goes to that which is different. Now, after that, once you see that first object, then we explore. Maybe you go down to the, the blue circle, or you look at the leaning brush, or whatever else it is that moves your eye around the frame. But I know for a fact the first thing you're going to see is that color palette. Why did your eye go to the woman in white? Because she's the brightest thing in the frame. She's brighter than the background. She's brighter than the windows behind. Yes, your eye moves from the woman on the left to the woman on the right. And then you realize they're in a restaurant and they're looking at a menu and they're thinking about what they're going to order. But I knew first you were going to go to the woman on the left. I could control. I could guide your eye on what you were going to see. She's bigger. She's not the brightest, but she's the biggest. My eye went first to her shoulder for some reason, because I think it was brighter than her face. And then I went up to her face and took a look at her before I explored the meeting that's going on in the background. I know you're going to look at her first, which tells me where you're going to go look second after you're done looking at her. And your eye looks at that which is in front, all things being equal. Just so happens that the person in front also happens to be the biggest, which helps. He's different. Everybody else is in color and he's in black. So there's multiple levels going on here, but I know you're going to check the person in the middle because he meets the criteria of being in front. Now, I, I can hear yawning in the background because you're saying, Larry, nobody actually pays attention to this stuff. We're just taking pictures. But think about it a different way. Your goal is to break through the, the, the clutter, break through the distraction to get the attention of the person you're trying to reach. And it's not just filmmaking. You're trying to pitch an investor to invest in your company. You're trying to catch the eye of a consumer to buy your product. You're, you're trying to pitch uh, as an engineer, an idea to management to have them give you the money to develop your product. All of these are trying to convince people to do something that they're not doing now. We got to we got to communicate, which means that as we craft our visuals, we want to use these six priorities to guide the viewer's eye around our image. Let me give you an example. Where did your eye go first? Of course, the woman in the center. Why? She was in front. Two, she's bigger. Three, she's brighter. How can you not look at the woman in the front? You have to see her first. Then I tend to look at the woman over to the left, and then I explore all the faces across the back. I can guarantee you're going to see the woman. What the, why do you think lead singers are in the front? Why do you think the people who are the star are the biggest? Ah, uh, you say, Larry, I don't take photographs. No, no, no. I have to build PowerPoint. My life is a PowerPoint production paradise, which is not easy to say. Well, take a look at this. Where did your eye go first? Not the small type in the low left corner. Went to the picture. We checked out the river. I flowed down to the stream of the fish. Looked at that for a few seconds, said, that's cool. It's Banff, by the way. Canada, Alberta, Canada. You slid over and said, oh, live stream, Fly Fishing National Championships, and that took you right down to the call to action. From the photo to the title to the subtitle to the call to action, that is guaranteed. 
just in the way that I use the images, change the color of the images, place the text, color of the text. One, two, three, four, your eye goes through steps at one right after the other. Now, I've been talking about still images and talking about PowerPoints. What about movement? This is a, a scene from a film called His Girl Friday. It was directed by Howard Hawks. It features Rosalind Russell in the front, Ralph Bellamy in the middle, and Cary Grant in the back. And this is where, the, near the beginning of the movie, where they are having a discussion and Cary Grant is meeting Rosalind Russell's fiancé for the first time, and he is not in favor of their marriage. So how are they using these six priorities in this scene? Well, let's just take a look. Notice how they're moving toward the camera. They're getting bigger and they're moving. There's lots of movement. And no, I turned the sound off because it's easier to pay attention to the picture. Scene runs about 30 seconds. The movement hasn't stopped. And look at how the movement goes sequentially. First she moves, then he moves, and then the other guy, Ralph Bellamy, tries to get a word in edgewise, but there's way too much busyness on the right-hand side of the frame. Well, let's just take a look at this and analyze it a bit more. I'm going to put a red arrow over the person that has the dominant movement in the frame, and on the top right corner, I'm going to describe the six priorities that are active at that moment in time. Clearly, everybody's moving. They're all getting bigger. Now she's in front. Movement shifts to the two guys trying to sit in the same chair. We're going back to Cary Grant. Ralph Bellamy keeps trying to get his attention, but Grant is not letting it go. Now we shift back. We get closer, so everybody's bigger again in the frame. They're brighter than everybody in the background. The movement is bouncing not with who is theoretically the feature, which is Ralph Bellamy on the left, but the two oddball characters on the right. This is just as carefully constructed for motion as it is for stills or as it is for PowerPoint. We're using the same six criteria. And what we're using are these criteria to guide the eye as we move from one part of an image to another so I can tell you my story, which is a key element of persuasion, tell you my story as the scene unfolds or the shot is analyzed. So those are the six priorities. That guides where the eye is going to look in the frame. But there's more to an image than just where the eye goes. There's also an emotional context. And here I want to show how we can boost emotions by changing the frame of our image. And probably the most important of these is called the rule of thirds. Here we have a woman riding a train looking out the window. I love the lighting in this. But there's more than just lighting, and there's more than just simply pointing the camera and shooting the picture. The construction of this shot has a very specific structure called the rule of thirds. If we lay a tic-tac-toe board over the top of the image, that which draws the eye, that which is the most captivating, occurs at the intersection of those lines, the top right corner where her eyes are, top left corner, lower right and the lower left. If you have something, for instance, an object which doesn't fit exactly at the intersection, it works the best if it's on one of those lines. And notice it's not the center. The reason it's not the center is the center is boring. As soon as we put something in the center of an image, our eye says, ah, it's in the center, and it immediately starts looking everywhere else in the frame. Here, you cannot help but keep coming back to that woman's face. You keep, well, I want to look out the train window. Yeah, but she's more important. It's like this weight that keeps put like gravity, pulls us back into the frame. It's called the rule of thirds. Let's take a look at this a different way. Here, again, we have a, another person riding a train. I seem to have this affinity for trains. Riding a train, looking out the window. If we put the rule of thirds on top of it, exact same position as the woman was, but now there's a difference. Let's go back to here. This is called looking room, the distance between, in this case, her eyes and the left-hand edge of the frame where she's looking. She's looking to the left. 
that big area in the frame is called looking room. And here, her, her looking room is quite wide. His looking room is quite narrow. Horror takes advantage of this all the time because there's a psychological thing that we as viewers do that's just completely irrational. Our thinking as a viewer is that the people in the photograph can only see to the edges of the frame. Here, she can see broadly. She's got this great view. She can see a great deal. It's a comforting, safe feeling. She can see everything that's coming up. Here, he's pushed up tight against the edge of the frame. This makes you nervous, makes you uncomfortable, gives you a sense of unease. Something is going to go wrong. Of course, he can see out the window. Of course, you know, if this is a horror film, the heroine is about to walk through the door where the evil villain is about to pounce on her. Well, you don't think she's not met the evil villain over the craft table having lunch the day before? She's seen what the makeup looks like. She's read the script. She knows she's going to be screaming in two and a half. She knows all this stuff. But our, our brain says she can only see to the edge of the frame and no more. So by positioning us tight to the edge of the frame, we heighten the emotion for good or for bad. It's called looking room. Now, there's another thing we can do, which is change the camera height. Most of us, when we take pictures with our cell phones, we hold the cell phone right up to our eye and take a picture. I'm 6'3". I've got a seven-year-old granddaughter who is somewhat shorter than that. And her pictures have an entirely different perspective because she's about two and a half feet closer to the ground than I am. If you look up at an object, it's called a heroic shot. Whatever you shoot seems bigger than life. This is one of the reasons we look up at statues. If you look down at something, that something we look down on is small or diminished or depressed or less or somehow reduced in value. And if you want to feel that you're the equal of somebody, put the camera directly at the eye height, the eye level of the person talking. This is why newscasters and politicians all want to have the camera exactly at their eye height. They, they may be more powerful than we are, but they want to give the emotional illusion that they are the equal of us. Larry, you say, nobody does this in real life. We do this so much in real life, it has its own name. It's called the hero shot. Ta-da! How can we not say this man is incredible? Burning building, looking up, incredible. Now, Take out the burning building, take out the guy, leave the camera exactly where it is, and put a product on a table and shoot up at the product. We use this shot so much, every commercial you see has a hero shot. We're looking up to the product. We are not worthy of buying this product. We oh, our, our worth in society will go up if we buy this product because we are looking up to it. Another difference, look at eye contact. Here on the left, we're voyeurs watching a little kid play with a camera. On the right, we're participants. The little kid, by simply looking at the camera, has involved us in the conversation. Now, there's times where you want eye contact, where you want the audience to feel involved. But there's other times where you want the audience to feel like they're looking over somebody's shoulder and looking at the camera totally breaks that fourth wall illusion. There's a huge emotional difference between looking over the shoulder and being a participant. Look at how these two shots make you feel. You can almost feel like I wanna walk closer to the kid on the left, he'll never know I'm coming because I wanna see what he's looking at. And the one on the right says, oh, I've been caught. I gotta pay attention, I have to behave, I need to participate. Eye contact is a very, very powerful thing. Also, another trap we fall into is we put the object that we're shooting in the center of the frame. His eyes are dead center in that image. With all that extra headroom, look at how that diminishes him. Look at how it, it just, he doesn't, it's the exact same shot on the right. And all I did is tilt the camera down. Well, I cropped it differently, to be truthful. And yet look at how much more present he is, how much it's, it's, I haven't changed the size of the shot. I just simply tilted down. And yet look at the difference emotionally between an okay, he's in the picture 
an O dominant subject just by changing the headroom or here. We have a bodiless head on the left. Look at how much more pleasing it is to not crop on a body joint. Don't crop at the neck, at the elbows, at the wrist, at the waist. Crop slightly closer, or in my case, slightly looser. Look at how the headless shot feels much less comfortable than the shot where we're seeing him head and shoulders. There's a lot we can do with our images just by the way we compose them, by the way we combine them, by the way we crop them to make our images more powerful. Now we have to combine it with the process of persuasion. And here I just want to give you some highlights in the time that we have left. A persuasive message is a clear message wrapped in a story delivered with emotion, targeted at a specific audience and providing a clear call to action. The clear message, don't pollute, wrapped in a story. Look at all of this garbage in the Tennessee River that we took out, 9,000 pounds of trash last week, delivered with emotion, an image of oil covered people digging garbage out with their hands, targeted at a specific audience teams, volunteer to help us clean the Tennessee River and providing a clear call to action. Show up next Saturday, five o'clock in the afternoon, and we'll clean the river. A clear message, which can apply to any audience, wrapped in a story, which is specific to an audience, delivered with emotion. Your audience has to care targeted a specific audience. If I were talking to high school students, I'd have a slightly different presentation. If I were talking to elementary kids, I would absolutely have a different presentation. It would still be that visuals are important and the visuals you use make a difference. But it would be a different story and it would use different images. And a call to action. A call to action is an explicitly stated behavior that you want the audience to do after seeing your message. It tells them what you want them to do and where they need to go to do it. The what and the where is critical. What I've learned, and this is, comes from years of teaching college kids, is audiences are no longer able to connect the dots. You show them a picture of a band, they will need to know what's the name of the band, where do we have to go, when do they perform, what do I need to do? There's too much distraction in our life. In the past, we could connect the dots. Today, we have to connect the dots for them. Probably the most eye-opening quote was one that Kevin Eikenberry made. Persuasion is a choice that we ask each viewer to make. It, it isn't what we tell people to do. We cannot command them. We need to encourage them to decide in our favor. I would love to, to say everybody needs to watch my presentation. I think this information is valuable, but I can't do that. All I can do is say, here's my information. You need to decide if you want to watch this. Persuasion is a choice that we ask each viewer to make. Now, words still matter, but the fewer the words, the more each matters. And how those words look is also important. Think of all the PowerPoints you've seen. Look at this one. We have a simple headline, a clear image, and a number. Well, what does that number mean? Well, no longer now are we paying attention to the slide. The slide has set up the presentation, which is where I described that 50% of the ducks migrating from Canada to Mexico are male. Who would have guessed? But now the slide isn't the star. I'm the star. You are the star of any of your presentations. You don't want to put all your text on the slide unless, for instance, in the definition of call to action, it's important that you understand what the words are. But in a presentation or when you're trying to convince somebody to do something, less words, much more powerful. People keep the focus on you. Or consider the colors that you use. Look at how the image on the left of the cleanest two room robot sucks the eyes out of your head and leaves them crushed on the ground. 
Whereas the image on the right, the background reinforces the text and makes the text much more easy to read. And you remember the text, not the fact that your head aches from watching that incredible bright yellow background. Or consider the fonts. Which of these two fonts better delivers the message of keepsakes, things in the past, pleasant memories? Is it the modern strident Futura on the left or the wistful thinking on the right? Same text, same message, same color, same everything except the fonts are different. Thinking about colors and thinking about fonts and thinking about words, we've all seen train wrecks, and this is a one that I like a lot. Oh, my goodness, what a catastrophe on two feet this is. Um, I'm working really hard to come up with something nice to say about this, and all I can come up with is the, the words are spelled correctly. <laughs> Let's get off that. To persuade others, we first need to get their attention. People judge our messages based on all the other messages they receive. You are competing against the entire world to get your message out there. It isn't just you. It's we're being inundated by messages from everybody. So give yourself every possible advantage that you can. What we show is just as important as what we say. And, and we can guide where the viewer's eye looks in on an image, whether it's moving or still, by paying attention to the six priorities. And because... None of us want to connect the dots. We all want to be told what to do so we can make our own decision. Every message needs to contain a clear call to action. Now, here I have a crass commercial pitch. This is a subset of my most recent book called Techniques of Visual Persuasion. I uh, published it just last summer, and this has been a summary of chapters two and three in the book. If this has caught your attention then jot down this web address and take a look at it. Uh, the Techniques of Visual Persuasion covers stills, image editing, PowerPoint presentations, shooting video, recording audio, creating motion graphics, anything dealing with images. It's all in an overview inside this book, and I'm very proud of it. Okay, let's shift out of this and go back to questions. If you haven't fired up the chat yet, fire up the chat. <laughs> Bryce writes, I'm reading this book now and it's great. Bryce, I have always liked you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Very kind. Uh, Laura, thank you also for the kind words. Uh, you, you are very kind, but give me a question. Otherwise, we're going to just stand here and stare at each other for a couple of minutes. So type something, would you? Because uh, otherwise, I'm going to end up... <laughs> <laughs> end up blushing. So questions. Mustafa. Oh, 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 Christian, you awake? Yeah, I'm awake. I'm right here, Larry. Okay, let's let's start with Mustafa. Sure, fantastic. Um, Mustafa asks, what's happened to the buzz and do you have any alternative? <laughs> Digital production buzz went on hiatus in May of 2019. Um, it was an expensive show to produce. Uh, we had a team of four people that worked on it, and it generated no advertising revenue. I sold my company to a, a firm uh, in New York who's been very good to us, and they sustained the buzz for three and a half years and realized that at this point, it was just sucking up too much cash and not generating any revenue. So they made the decision to put it on the shelf for a while till we figure out how to make money at podcasts. Uh, I'm hoping the buzz comes back. Um, but um, one of the things I like about the buzz is that we really covered a wide variety of things about media, and I'm hoping we can do that again in the future. But there's no immediate plans to bring it back. It's something we're talking about for this year. And we have Dennis who asks about the interview shot, looking at the camera, left, right. Uh, you read that perfectly, Christian, but I'm trying to figure out what we're talking about. Oh. So Dennis, give me a better question. Uh, we need to have Christian practices reading anyway. So <laughs> we're going to come back to Dennis and Bill, go ahead. Uh, go with Bill's question. Sure. 
we have Bill who asks, in a video, if the only person is speaking directly to the audience, shouldn't he, she be in the center of the frame rather than on one of the one thirds vertical lines? No, why? Why put them in the center? Bill, look at your picture right now. You're not centered, you're off center. Now, what happens if I gotta, this is, I gotta, uh, we're gonna go over here this way. This is the newscaster position. Notice I'm on one of the rules of third. I've got the room for the graphic over my camera right shoulder. I'm leaning intently, look, where's the camera? I'm leaning intently into the, leaning intently into the camera. And I've got an angle, a diagonal, which provides a, very few shots need to be centered because your eye gets bored. You look at me sitting in, in my study and you say, why does he have two speakers on either side of his head? That is the oldest file cabinet I've ever seen in my life. And now you're analyzing my decor. You're not watching me. If I'm off to one side, every time you think you want to look at the file cabinet, you keep coming back to me because I'm off center. It draws your eye back. So do you want the person to capture the frame? Or do you want the person to simply do a five second on camera then you go to B-roll and B-roll covers the rest of it? I want the person to be capturing the frame. So every interview I've ever shot is I always have the person off center. I always have them at slightly an angle and turn. Where's, how do I do the body? There we go. Turn the body. There we go. That's what I want. Tilt up at the camera. Whew. Tough. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm almost never center. It's just, it's just too boring. And with okay, Kristen, who's next? We have Dennis who asks about the video interview shot. Should you be looking at the camera or off camera? So I think this goes back actually to what Dennis, if I understood Dennis's question correctly, um, it's about where you should be looking. So looking off camera or looking towards the camera? Um, for those of you who have never been on camera, being shot by a camera is incredibly intimidating. It, you spend all your time worrying about whether your hair is straight and, and whether there's a spot of dust on your cheek. It is so easy to say people are looking at me. And because I interview amateurs versus professionals most of the time, I have them always talk to me because then it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation between me and the guest and the camera just sort of disappears and the guest becomes much more comfortable. Um, it took me, uh, I don't know, five years at least, maybe longer, to get comfortable talking to the camera. I, I could not get out of myself. I was so busy evaluating what I was saying and whether it was accurate and whether I was stumbling over my words and did I have the right emotion and, and did I put a period at the end of that? I was so busy self-evaluating that I forgot what my content was. It, it, that is a really, really hard position to put any amateur in. It's just scary. So I almost always have them talk to me if they're an amateur. If they're a pro, then I work really hard to make sure that the camera does not become intimidating by hiding as many people away from the camera so they're not distracted by crew standing behind it. So if, and again, if I want to be a voyeur, then I'd never have them look at the camera. If I want to have them deliver a personal message, then I will always have them look at the camera. So uh, you've got a Will Smith doing a testimonial. Will will look at the camera. Will Smith to you, buy this product. I want to have Will Smith uh, discuss working with another actor. I'll have him talk off camera so I can be a voyeur eavesdropping on this conversation because I don't want to feel like I'm participating. I want to feel like I'm hearing secrets. So there's, I will use the emotional connection or disconnection by having them look or not look at the camera. What do we got next? So we have Bryce actually who asks a really fantastic question. I've seen a lot less looking space in dramatic programming over the last few years. Are there any other changes that are happening that seem to undo certain rules we learned 20 plus years ago? Do you notice that as a trend? Uh, oh, there we go. I had to find it. I've seen a lot less looking space. I think the number one definition of creativity is breaking the rules. And when I'm, what I teach my college kids and what I was talking about today, are these are some of the basic rules that follows framing. This, I'm not saying none of this stuff is new. We discovered a long time ago. It's just we haven't shared it with general audiences. Therefore, until you know what the rules are, you don't know what you're breaking. If I put my face, I got to figure out where I'm going to do this. Well, if I put my face against the edge here, it feels uncomfortable. 
just because you feel that all I see is, is the edge of the frame. Uh, well, once you understand that the, the audience perceives the frame as the limits of what the character can see, now you can start to play with that by adjusting looking room because you understand the visceral reaction to all of us get. So if looking room increases or decreases, that really is, is playing with the idea that what you see is only in the, um, what you see is only in the frame. And that to me is just mind bending. Because from, from directing and, and being in the studio, I see everything all the time. And it wasn't until I had that, that revelation that the audience doesn't see what I see that I suddenly realized the importance of the frame. Next. Wonderfully put. Mustafa asks, what is your teaching philosophy and how do you keep on top of all the latest developments in the industry? <laughs> I long ago gave up on keeping track of all the developments in our industry. Uh, there's just too much. One of the things I really like is I'm very grateful to people to send me emails and ask questions because as I answer their question, I learn and I get anywhere from 10 to 20 emails a day and I'm happy to answer all of them. And you guys are welcome to send me notes as well because it's in trying to find answers together that I learn just wandering the web to say what idle piece of information is just boring. I, 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 I don't do a lot of that, but directed research I do a lot of. The teaching philosophy, people are terrified of technology and people are terrified of learning something new because they're afraid they're not going to be able to learn it. So my teaching philosophy is to take the fear away. Um, very first thing I encourage my students to create, I say, what you're going to create next is going to be of so little socially redeeming value that most of us would consider it garbage and you will be embarrassed to look at it tomorrow. So don't even worry about creating something that looks good. You can't. It's just, just, just create this ugly thing because I want you to learn how the tech works. I don't want you to create art yet. I don't want you to put that burden on yourself that I have to create something beautiful. Just can you open the file? Can you draw a line? Can you change the color of the line? Can you delete the line? Can you save the file? Congratulations, you've learned the process. Now, now that we know the process, we can go back and start to make it look beautiful again. But there's, and, and I, I see this in myself, I've been working in media since before all you children were born. And, and there's still parts of it that make me nervous. And if I get nervous, then think about people who are trying to learn it for the first time. So my, my teaching philosophy is totally wrapped around the idea of taking fear away. And then after that, taking the fear away, teaching the process, providing the fundamentals. And then once they master that, the art will flow because we're all naturally creative in different ways. But if you're so busy worried about, I'm going to break the computer or the software is going to blow up or people are going to laugh at me or I don't know how to save the work. If, if you're trapped in that fear cycle, you're never going to learn anything. So I spent a lot of time taking that fear away. Open a file, save the file. That was great. Do it again. Open a file. Save the file. Oh, that was fabulous. Do it again. Open a file. Save. Well, by now they're bored to death. They, they'll never worry about saving the stupid file again. <sighs> I digress. Fear. <laughs> it's absolutely overcoming fear. What do we got? What's next? So we actually have Bryce who has a question in terms of your teaching style. So he asks if you make your students stay off their mobile devices in the classroom. But he also asks, how do you deal with students who know it all? <laughs> I have not found any way to get people to stay off their mobile device at all, period. Oh, my goodness, what a disaster those are. If they don't check Facebook every five minutes, the world has ended. Um, so I warn them to get off their mobile device, and then I humiliate them mercilessly. Uh, it's, it's, now I can't take the mobile device away. They will implode. They'll self-destruct. There will be a little puddle of, of quivering student in the chair. Um, so all I can do is embarrass them. Um, I don't let them take phone calls. I won't do that. But oh my goodness, that's just, it's just a mess. And um, I'm sorry, Christian, go ahead. And what do you do with the know-it-alls? <laughs> I challenge them to a contest and see who knows more. I haven't lost yet. But the, the, the key is for a know-it-all, is there a know-it-all because they're afraid? 
They're a know-it-all because they think if they don't, they're, they're, they're afraid to say, I don't know, because it makes them feel like they are less worthy. So they act as a know-it-all as a defense mechanism. So I treat know-it-alls, uh, I mean, if they're really obnoxious, I'll throw them out of the classroom. I've done that once. Uh, but most of the time, a know-it-all is just wants to, what a know-it-all really wants to know is, does the professor know more than I do? If the professor knows more than I do, then I can sit back and learn. And if I know more than a professor, why am I spending $8 million to sit in this classroom to learn from an idiot? So I just have to reassure them that I do know what I'm talking about. And once I reassure them that I know what I'm talking about, then, then they settle down and relax and they start to learn. And the other thing I'll do with a know-it-all, there's, I've had, I am not a Photoshop artist. I'm a Photoshop editor, but not an artist. I've had people that create Photoshop work in my classes that are it's just amazing. So I use them. I say, show me how to do this. Show the class how you did this. Showcase their skills. Make them feel like they're special. And I've only had two people that were really ridiculous know-it-alls. And they decided to be a know-it-all for the entire semester. So I stopped calling on them after a while. And, and they sort of sat in the back of the room. And after a while, they stopped coming. And fine, everybody was happy. It's a hard, mobiles are harder. Those, those are impossible. But know-it-alls basically just need reassurance that you know something and want to learn from them. We have about four minutes left. Christian, pick something. Yeah, so we actually, we're all out of questions. Um, if anyone would like to send something in, oh, we have something from Dennis, which is most likely to distract you from your message, poor audio or poor video? Uh, Dennis, close your eyes. All right, now, which makes more sense? watching me wave my hand as I'm talking or listening to me talk. Audio wins every time. Now with the visuals, because I'm talking techniques of visual persuasion, it'd be kind of hard to close your eyes while I'm describing the rule of thirds, though I could do it. It's kind of hard to perceive. But audio is like 90% of your picture. We spend all the money and all the time and all the effort and all the crew to make gorgeous pictures and most of the time, if you turn the picture off, you'd still enjoy the movie. I had a panel yesterday. We had six people on a panel. It was a great panel. There was no reason to have video because all we were doing is sitting quietly with talking heads talking to each other. I was interviewed for a, a television program last Tuesday. It was a 35-minute interview. There was no reason for video because there was no visual information being conveyed. But we're visual people. We like to see. We want to know what's happening. So the visuals tell us what's happening. The audio conveys the content. <coughs> Excuse me. Content. Most importantly, the audio delivers the emotion. You care because of what you hear. Um, you, you, you understand because you see. Um, and Laura Peters, who asks, where can we see the show you spoke on last week? Uh, you can't yet. It hasn't been posted, but I publish a newsletter uh, called the Edit Smarter Newsletter, and I'll have a link to it when it goes live. So it'll be published in my newsletter this Monday. And you can go to my website, LarryJordan.com, and sign up for the newsletter. <laughs> and um, we also have Megan, who asks, could audio be considered the message in a still message or an ad? How do you be considered the message? No, in a still message, in a still video, audio doesn't apply any more than a photograph. Uh, um, there's, um, uh, I'm looking at a couple of really brilliant photographers in the audience, and some of the images you create are just mind-boggling. They're just beautiful. And there's no audio with it, uh, yet they still have emotion. They still tell a story. They still convey a message even without audio but if you have audio or look at it another way when you put a montage together why do you put music with them with the montage the music is there to drive the emotion to tell the audience what they should be feeling while you are looking at those images look at how much less that montage would have in it the less emotional impact if it didn't have music the images are still gorgeous but we want to reinforce the gorgeous images with the music 